All right, hi everybody. Uh, this little video here I'm going to make for us uh, that kind of centers around, um, I guess pun intended there, measures of center. So when we talk about a measure of center, what we're really talking about, oh, let me get a different color here. There we go. A measure of center All right, uh, is a value at the center, obviously, or middle of a dat data set. Now, there are different ways that we measure this center, and each way um, is kind of dependent upon the data that you've collected. For example, if you're going to use uh, quantitative data, you're going to use the mean or the mode. Those, those, uh, they work well for quantitative data. Um, even the mid range, mid range is another one deals with quantitative data. Uh, if you're dealing with qualitative or categorical data, then the mode really helps out with that. Okay, now do not just automatically assume that if you have numbers that you have quantitative data. You, qualitative data can also be numbers. Okay, for example, zip codes. Zip codes are a really good example of qualitative data. The zip code, the numerical value, just gives us an idea of where do you live. However, the numbers themselves do not hold any intrinsic value to them. Um, zip codes, what else? Area codes. That's another one, okay? So, like I said, just because you see numbers, do not assume it's quantitative. You have to understand or you have to look at either A, what you're studying, or B, uh, if you're reading somebody's research uh, paper or something like that, um, the data that they've collected and how did, how did they identify their variables within the study, Okay. Now, the first one we're going to be talking about is the one that I think everybody is familiar with, and that's going to be the mean. Um, another way to say that is the arithmetic mean. Or the average. Okay. And um, we define that numerically or, or in a formula as X bar. Okay. So this is red X bar. And this is going to be equal to the summation of all the XI's all over lowercase n. Now, before we get a little nervous here, uh, let me explain what you, each one of these symbols mean. X bar stands for the mean. This is called sigma, this weird looking E, and that just means to add, okay? Now the X represents your variable and the little i represents each individual data value that is associated with the variable. So you're just adding up all the different um, data values that you've collected. Now this lowercase n is actually very important. This is the total number of samples. Okay, and I'm going to underline the word samples. Now, in chapter one, we went over samples. Remember, a sample is a subset of a population. Okay, so real quick, if you forgot, let's say you have an island and you are studying a certain type of plant. The entire island would be your population. However, on this island, you have all these different little places where you collected data and all those little places are called samples, all right? So we can call that S1, this is S2, this middle one is S3 and so forth, okay? Now, the mean has some properties associated with it. First, we always like means that are drawn from the same population, all right? Now, if they're drawn from the same population, you're going to actually see that you have less 
variation, okay? And what that means kind of is this. Um, if we were collecting these plants on our, on our island up above, as long as we're on that island, we're going to have less variation when it comes to calculating the mean for sample one, sample two, sample three, and so forth. I mean, there's, it's still going to vary. However, the variation is going to be less. Now, if you're studying this plant on a different planet, I would expect the variation to be very large because you're on a completely different planet here. All right. Now, the second property, when you're calculating the mean, you use every data value. Now, that has its advantages and disadvantages. Let me write the word value a little cleaner. An advantage, hey, you're using every data value. That's fantastic. Disadvantage, what if one of those data values is actually an outlier? And what I mean by that is this. Let's say you're looking for an apartment. And the apartments in the area that you're interested in all have the following rents. So uh, let's see here, $8, or $8. I wish rent was $8, right? $800, $850. Maybe you got a really fancy one for $950 a month. But then across your, or a road behind you, there's one apartment that you looked at. And it's $2,500 a month. Now, this is what we call an outlier. And that's going to dramatically affect our mean. And that actually is the last property, okay, which is the mean itself is sensitive to outliers. Meaning it, that this mean right, or this value right here, this 2,500, is dramatically going to pull the mean to the right, okay? And that's when we start talking about, you know, like, what does the data look like? Is it skewed left? Is it skewed right? Is it, is it right down the middle? Okay. So these are all things that we need to keep track of when we're thinking about calculating the mean. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to do a really easy example uh, using just a small data set. And then I'm going to show you how to calculate it using salt, because I think that's very important that we learn how to use that. So here's our first example. Calculate X bar for 30, 40, 50, and 72. Okay? So X bar is going to equal. Now, each one of these values, this is X1, X2, X3, and X4. So that's where that XI thing came in. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each one of these, and we're just going to add them all up. And then we're going to divide by the total sample size. In this case, it's four. So when we total in the numerator, we get 192 over four. And 192 divided by four is 48. And that's what our, our uh, mean is right there. Now, I gave us a very simple problem here. Four data values, not big. I didn't even define what X is. The thing with statistics is computationally it's a pretty easy class what really makes this difficult is large data sets and then if we define what this variable is you need to tell me what that variable actually represents with a nice sentence at the very end so for example let's just say uh, this represented the weights so x equals the weight of bear cubs I don't know about you, but I think bear cubs are really cute. I'd love to hold one. Uh, just I hope, you know, mama bear's not around because then I think uh, mama bear will get very upset. So if X represents the weight of bear cubs, what I would say is, given the data collected, the average... Or better yet, let's say let's let's say that let's say it like this: the mean weight of bear cubs in this sample is forty-eight pounds. Now, I don't know about you, but let's let's think about these two answers I have. The first one is, and and hypothetically hypothetically speaking, let's say you you were my boss and I come up to you. And you ask me, you know, hey, floater, did you calculate uh, the, uh, the, the uh, mean weight or did you calculate what I asked you to? And I just said 48. 
I don't know about you, but I would definitely look at me and go, what does that even mean, 48? 48 what? Or if I gave you this answer, you asked me, hey, did you did you calculate what I needed you to? And I came back and I said, oh, yeah, given the data collected, the mean weight of the bear cubs in the sample is 48 pounds. So much nicer. So not all problems are going to require you to write a sentence. I highly encourage you to write a sentence because it starts to make sense. And, and on top of it, you start to begin to own the problem because you're writing something about it. All right. So what I'm going to do now is just transition over into salt uh, to show you how to do this. So let me pull up one of our homework problems. Okay, so here's question number five. And as you can see here, we have uh, use the following n equals 15 measurements to answer the questions. And we have a couple questions below. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to use this. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So we have 57, 65, 62, 60, and so forth. And then for these measurements, uh, we've calculated that the mean is 61.467. Uh, M equals 62, which is the median. More on that in a little bit. And the mode is 62 and more on that in a little, in a little bit. So what I want to do is I'm going to show you how we actually got those numbers. So all you have to do is just take your cursor or your mouse, whatever you want to call it, and just click on use salt. And then uh, you're going to have this window open up. Now, what's nice, you get this little message. Your data has been transferred from web assigned successfully, which really makes me feel good. So I'm just going to go ahead and click on that. And on the left, or I'm sorry, right below, you're going to see that we have all of our data values. Now, this only shows, I think, like the first 15 or 20 data values. So um, you could see 1 through 15. And then uh, sometimes you may have to click the next page just to see more data values. Okay. But for now, we got 15. We're good. All right. Now, across the top, upper left hand corner, you're going to see data set. You're going to see descriptive statistics. You're going to see charts and graphs, uh, distribution calculators, sampling, inferential statistics, uh, statistics, and regression. We will use every single one of those, every single one of these tabs throughout the semester. All right. For now, the only thing we really got to be worried about descriptive statistics, charts and graphs. Also on the left hand side, you're also going to see where it says data set and directly underneath um, existing data set is actually highlighted, but you can also upload your own data if you wanted to. Uh, what I'll do is I will make a little YouTube tutorial on how to do that. It's very simple. I think the video will take me like two minutes if that. All right, but let's go ahead. Let's let's click on descriptive statistics. Now, down the first column, we're going to see all the different numerical statistics that we can calculate. So we can calculate the mean, the standard deviation, capital N, more on that later, uh, the sum, sum of squares, population, standard deviation, minimum value, Q1, median, Q3, all, I mean, all this stuff, categorical statistics, everything. And you can see a lot of them are already highlighted. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of all these. So what I want to do is I want to keep the mean. Let's get rid of standard deviation excuse me, standard deviation. We're going to keep the number of statistics. Let's keep the median. Uh, and then all these categorical, categorical statistics we're going to get rid of. And as I'm clicking on them, on the right-hand side, you're going, to, you're going to see that what's ever left over is going to be exactly what I wanted. Now, what's nice about this, you can always copy and paste uh, your, your results. So what I'm going to do here is just click on this. And then, uh, I don't know if you're familiar but if you have a Windows computer, you can just go into search and just type in snip for snipping tool. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to take this, highlight what I want to snip, and then I get just a screenshot of exactly what I wanted. So then I can go back into my notes here and just paste it right into our notes. All right. And let me resize this real fast. So it looks pretty good. There we go. All right. So that, that's looking okay. That's looking okay. But at least what I really wanted to show you here is uh, how do we actually use salt? Okay. Um, I'll do it one more time because, like I said, it's really easy. Just click on it. It's going to import your data automatically. From here, descriptive statistics. That's what we're talking about in chapters 1, 2, uh, and I, th I forget what three is, but I think in three, uh, select what statistics you want to see, which ones you don't just unclick them. And then from there, that's it. Now, 
<clears throat> another thing we can do with this is we can actually look at charts and graphs because if you if I go back to this problem here, all right, um, and we're going to answer this in a second, but they also want us to do a dot plot. So I'll show you how to do a dot plot. So let me show you how to do that first. So let's go back to our data, charts and graphs. We're going to just click on that, and then it's going to say, okay, what type do you or what type of graph do, or chart do you want to create? Well, we want to create a, a dot plot. So let's click on dot plot. And then we need to select a variable. So over here on the left-hand side where it says settings, we're just going to click the down arrow, and we're going to click on measurement. And as soon as we do that, here's our dot plot right here. So we can actually take the results from uh, our statistical analysis tool and then just compare that with some of the answers uh, within our homework. All right? So I don't know. We'll worry about that later. I think I think you can match that up. What I want to talk about now is the median and the mean. Now, I didn't show you how to calculate the median yet. I will. But for now, what I want you to look at are these two numbers right here. Notice that the mean is 61.4 and the median is 61. Since those numbers are very, very close to each other and the mode is 62, even that number is extremely close to each other. What, what, I can, what I can summarize is that since all three of these measurements are so close to each other, that this data is going to be roughly symmetric. It's going to have this, this little bell-shaped curve thing. So let me go click on roughly symmetric. And then, like I said, from here, we can kind of just eyeball which, uh, oh, sorry. We can eyeball which one of our... Uh, dot plots we have and if you look right in the middle you have the most dots and then to the left and to the right it kind of looks it, it kind of looks like it's uh like it's creating like a bell-shaped curve let me let me show you what i mean by that i'm gonna go ahead and just snip what i need i'm gonna put this into our notes here so just give me a second here we go and as you can see here i can start down here and just kind of come up and then back down so it kind of looks like a bell-shaped curve, okay? And that's what we mean by roughly symmetric. The left and the right-hand sides are approximately the same. It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, next I want to show you how to calculate the mean. Oh, I'm sorry, the median, the median, my bad. And I'm going to use this data set that we have here. So let me go back to our problem. Uh, notice I still got salt up, so I'm still going to use that again because that's going to help me out tremendously with this. So... I'm going to go ahead and we're going to copy and paste this into our notes. All right. So one of the things when we talk about measures of center, the other one is called the median. Now, the median is physically the number It's physically the number, actually, let me just write it like this, number centered in a, and this is the important part, a sorted data list, okay? So the key to finding the median is you need to sort your data, all right? And if you look at what the data we have right now, it is not sorted whatsoever. However, we can use salt to help us out a lot. So I'm gonna go back to salt and I'm gonna show you how to sort the data. Okay, so here's our data set and it's super, super easy. Um, in the middle column, our variable is measurement. And notice that when I move my cursor over top of the word measurement, it turns into a hand. And to the left, you're gonna see in gray, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look real close, you're gonna see an arrow pointing up. And I'm just gonna click on that arrow once. And by clicking on it, now all of my data is sorted, okay? And from here, I can go ahead and find the middle of my data set, all right? So what I'm going to do here is just copy and paste this into our notes. Nope, don't want to link. There we go.
Okay, now, when n is odd, you're going to look for the middle value. When n is even, find the middle location and add actually let me just do let me let me write it like this find a middle location and calculate the following so i'm going to say x1 plus x2 and divided by 2 and that will equal your median so in this case we have 15 measurements so n is going to be the number physically in the middle. <clears throat> so if you think about this, if, you, if we count this, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and label everything. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. If we come to this observation right there, notice that I have 1 through 7 values on the left-hand side of it or above it. And then, and I'm going to write it in red just so you can see me counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven values below that or on the right-hand side of that. So right here is going to be my medium value, okay? So I think it's only fair that I show you how to calculate the median with uh, n, e n is an even number of values. So... Find the median for 30, 40, 50, and 2,500. Now I'm using, I'm using these. Um, actually, no, I didn't use 30, 40, and 50. I think I used what are those numbers again? 8, 850, 950. Okay, sorry. 800, 850. 950 and then 2500 now earlier i said that the mean is very sensitive to outliers however the median is not so what we're going to do is i'm going to highlight these two numbers because right here is the physical middle location and all i'm going to do is just add these numbers up and divide it by two and you should get 900 so our median in this situation would be 900 notice even though we have this 2500 outlier it did not affect the me or the median whatsoever so let's talk about some properties for the median and there's really not much first one is what we just experienced it is not sensitive to outliers And then the second does not use all data values. In other words, we're just looking for either the physical number located in the middle or the location and then adding the two and dividing it or and cutting it in by half, okay? Now the mode is very simple, all right? It's just a number, number or numbers that occur in highest frequency. So for example, I can have, um, I can have these values right here, one, 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 two, 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 three, four, five, and seven. And here's a situation where you have a bimodal set. So it's bimodal and the modes are one comma two because one appears three times and two appears three times. And that's one of the properties that we have with the mode. 
first, it can be multi-modal. And second, and this is really what I, what I would use the mode for, uh, is that it can be used with qualitative data. <clears throat> so an example of that, if I have a graph, all right, let's say this is five, this is three, and this is eight, and these numbers represent tacos, pizza, and, oh, what's another? Oh, chicken tenders. So maybe you, uh, maybe you're teaching a class and you ask the class, hey, what is your favorite lunch? Five students said tacos, three students said pizza, and then eight students said chicken tenders. Notice these are numerical values. You counted them. However, we're concerned with qualitative data here. So the mode would be chicken tenders because that was the highest frequency count that we have. All right. The last measure of center is called the mid-range. And the mid-range is out. It, it's very simple. It's We don't use it uh, that much. In fact, uh, oh, I, I really got to think about this. But I don't think I've ever read a research article where they define the mid-range of a set of that data for me. Like, I, it's always... It's always like the mean if it's quantitative and the mode if it's qualitative, all right? But the mid-range is just a number in the middle. I know that's very vague, and I'm sorry, but that's just what it is. And to calculate it, our mid-range is going to equal the max value plus the minimum value divided by two. <clears throat> um, some properties. As you can see, it's easy to compute. Um, it's very sensitive to outliers. And another one is you just, you, you lose the richness of the data. I mean, you may... You may have you may have four thousand different data values that that you and your research team has collected over the course of five years, and you're just going to tell me you're going to use the minimum and the max value, and the other ones in between mean nothing. So, I mean, just by giving you that example, I hope you can see how the mid range, although it gives you an idea, it is just not the the way to go. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Um, I would only use the mid-range if you have like a very, very small data set. And let's be honest, if you have a very, very small data set, you're probably just going to calculate the mean anyways. Okay? So now we're going to talk about the mean for frequency distribution. So we studied frequency distributions in the previous chapter. And it's actually very simple. I'm not going to go too far into it. I'll just give you the formula. But to calculate uh, the mean for frequency distribution, now I like to use subscripts. Your book doesn't. Uh, I, I've noticed that a lot of books, they don't use subscripts. So what I do is when I'm writing my notes or I'm studying something, I'll put subscripts or like a little word that reminds me, oh, this is what I was talking about. So the mean for frequency distribution is going to equal the summation. of the frequencies times x, all divided by the summation of all your frequency counts. So let me show you a really small example on how to do that. What I'm gonna do here is just kind of give a, a very small frequency distribution, um, one through 10, 11 through 20, and then 21 through 30, okay? And here we have three, uh, we have 10, and we have five, all right? Now, I'm doing this very deliberately with the numbers I chose because right now you should be sitting there thinking, oh, the mean is gonna be somewhere around 10. And the reason for that 
is I have the highest frequency count within this class. So my 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 mean is going to be somewhere in between. I'm sorry, I said 10. I meant 11 through 20. Like it's going to be somewhere in that vicinity because I have a frequency count of 10. So let me show you how to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to take the frequency times x for each one of these, okay? Now in this case, we have to make a little bit of a, an adjustment. And what I mean by that is notice that we have these classes 1 through 10, 11 through 20, 21 through 30. So the x that we're going to calculate is going to be the midpoint for each one of these classes. So the midpoint for the first class is going to be 1 plus 10 divided by 2, or 5.5. .5. And then uh, for the second one, we're going to have 11 plus 20 and divide that by 2. So that's going to be 15.5. And then 21 plus 30 and divide that by 2. And that's going to be 25.5. So this is going to equal 3 times 5.5 .5 plus 10 times 15.5 plus 5 times 25.5, all divided by the summation of the frequency count. Well, in this case, our total frequency count is going to be 3 plus 10 plus 5, or 18. Now, when I total the numerator, I get 299 divided by 18. And then 299 divided by 18 equals 16.6. .6, or if I just want to round this to the nearest whole number, it's going to be 17, which is exactly what we would think. Um, when you look at what we have here in this frequency distribution, notice in the first class, you only have a frequency count of 3. In the second class, you have a frequency count of 10. But then in the third class, you have a frequency count of 5. So... I know my midpoint is going to be somewhere in between 11 and 20. And when I look and when I look here at the 3 and the 5, since 21 through 30 has a higher frequency count, that's going to pull my mean a little bit closer to 20 versus 11. And that's exactly when they end up happening with a value of 17. All right? So the last thing we're going to do is a weighted mean. And this is how I calculate your grade. So, a weighted mean. Now to calculate this, and I just put a little subscript of the W, so it's the weighted mean. This looks very similar to above. We have the summation of the weights times X divided by the summation of all your weights. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out our syllabus. I'm going to I'm going to go to the section where um, uh, where we have our weights for each each uh, category, and then we're going to calculate what our grade is. Okay. All right. So what I had to do is a little digging, but luckily for us, I found what I needed. So homework is worth twenty percent of our grade. I guess HM doesn't work. How about HW? Homework. Uh, chapter exams are worth 35% of our grade. Quizzes are worth 25% of our grade. And then the final exam is 20% of our grade. So if we think about just these numbers, let's forget about the percents. Let's just think about 20, 35, 25, and 20. That totals up to 100. So what I've done is out of out of these 100 possible points in our class for this semester, 20 points are reserved for homework, 35 points are reserved for exams, 25 points for quizzes, and then 20 points for the final exam, respectively. So what I do is I calculate the average of all of your homework scores. So <clears throat> because I give you unlimited attempts at the homework, I'm hoping we all get perfects on our homework. So... Our average, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to put a little column. I'll put X bar. And this X bar is going to represent the X within our formula, okay? So your average homework score was 100. The weight 
is 0 0.20. All right? Now, exams. Um, let's say you're a decent student, okay? So if you're a decent student, I'm guessing you're going to get between a 75 and an 80 percent. Uh, 75 and 85, so let's just say your average exams, when I total all them up, 78%. All right? Well, I'm going to multiply that by 0.35. Now, your quizzes, once again, you're pretty good. We'll say 82. So I multiply that by 0.25. And then lastly, the final exam. And let's say your final exam, you studied really hard and everything, and you got, a, uh, you got an 88 on it which is fantastic, all right? So according to our weighted mean, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply each one of these, and then I'm just gonna total all of them up, all right? So real quick, <coughs> excuse me, 100 times 0.20 is 20, 78 times 0.35, sorry, I'm using my calculator here. So if you hear like little buttons in the background, I'm very sorry for that. Is 27.3, uh, 82 times 0.25 is going to be 20.5, and then 88 times 0 0.20 is going to be 17.6, and then when I add all these up, 20 plus 27.3 plus 20.5 plus 17.6 is an 85.4. So that's your total grade right there. You'd get a B in my class. Now let me show you what this looks like within this formula. What we did is we took the summation of the weights times the average score in that category. So that's the variable. It's just the average score. So I'm just going to, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to write this out because I'm, I'm a stickler for stuff like that. So here we go. Plus 78 times 0.35 plus 82.3 times 0.25 plus 88 times 0 0.20. And then we add up all of the weights. And if you did this calculation, you would come up with 85.4. And like I said, that's a solid B, all right? Now, <clears throat> I always get this question at the end of the semester, all right? And, um, and hopefully after tonight, or after you watch this video, you will not have to email me at the end of the semester. And here's the question. What do I need <laughs> to get an A? All right? So, or better yet, how about this? Let me be more specific. I know we've all been here. What do I need on the final to get an A, okay? So, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna take our data above, and we're just gonna switch it up a little bit here. Here's what you don't know. You don't know what you're gonna get on the final, and when we don't know something in math, we abbreviate it with an X. So, this is gonna equal 0.20X. Now, to calculate the weighted mean, we know that we need to take the summation of all the weights times their frequency, or, or I'm sorry, all the weights times X, and then divide by the total weight. So X bar equals the summation times X, the weights all over the summation. I'm starting to rush all over the weight. Now, here's the thing. You want to get an A. Now, I don't care where you go. A 90% A is the same exact thing as a 99% A. And the reason for that, we do not put down percentages on transcripts. So if you just want to get an A, all you need is 90%. That's it. Okay? So let's go ahead <clears throat> and let's calculate this. You want an A in the class. This is going to be our weighted mean. So it's going to be 90 equals... And I need to zoom out of here just a tad so I can see all of my weights and stuff. So we have 100 times 0 0.20 plus 78 times 0.35 plus 82 times 0.25 plus 0.20x. And hopefully you've bought into the notion that when I 
total up everything, it's one, okay? Because we're adding point, I'll just write it out. We're adding 0.20 plus 0.35 plus 0.25 plus 0.20. So the denominator is going to be a 1. So what I'm really left over with is 90 equals. And give me a second here. I'm just going to total that numerator. So we get 20 plus 78 times 0.35 plus 82 times 0.25. So this gives me 67.8 plus 0.20x. This is a uh, standard linear equation in one variable. So I'm just going to subtract 68, or I'm sorry, 67.8 from both sides. On the right-hand side, that gives me 0.20x. On the left-hand side, that's going to give me 22.2. .2. Now, divide both sides by 0.20. So 22.2 .2 divided by 0.2 equals a 111, which means on the final exam, you'd have to get a 111% to get an A. The only way you're going to do that is if, I, is if you get every single problem correct, and then, and then I give you extra credit, extra credit on the final. But let's really be honest here. A 90%, although it's an A, it's not the lowest A. Because... I'm a pretty nice person, at least I think I am. So in red, let's see what happens when I switch this to 89.5. Let's see. I mean, it's not going to drop dramatically, but it, but it'll it, it'll it'll drop. It'll come down a little bit. So 89.5 minus 67.8. 21.7 and now when I take that number and divide it by 0.2 you get 109 so unfortunately it's going to be really really difficult to get to get uh, an A <clears throat> my thing here is this if you watched my YouTube video and how I conduct class and everything if you ask questions you do your homework on time and everything and you're at an 88 or an 89 percent uh Chances are, if I re if I recognize your name because you've been asking me questions and everything, I'll, I might just round you up a little bit because you've you've demonstrated that you wanted to be in my class, that you wanted to learn about statistics and probability. Um, but that's going to be it for um, this little lecture on measures of center. In the next video, we're going to talk about measures of variation. It's really not difficult at all. I will talk to you, I guess, in the next one. Bye.